Aviation who are witnessing this motion picture. Travel by train and airplane from California to the east or from the east to California is the modern achievement in transportation. To save time, to see America first, and to enjoy the real fun of flying, I recommend it to you. And I am sure Colonel Lindbergh, who is chairman of our technical committee, and Mr. C.M. Keyes, one of America's pioneers in airplane transportation, who are sitting here with me, also recommended to you. Incidentally, you see Colonel Lindbergh in this picture making one of his regular inspection trips over the route which he helped to select for this great rail airline. And now, just picture yourself taking this rail and air the bus. In the heart of New York, a great railroad station marks the beginning of your transcontinental rail and air journey from coast to coast. Here at any one of the windows we buy our tickets to California, as simply as we would ordinarily buy just the rail ticket alone. Then, at the gateway to the train, friends see us off. There's a new kind of spirit in the air each day when this train departs. It's like those moments before a smart deluxe liner sets sail for Paris and the Riviera. And at exactly 6.5 p.m., the Airway Limited, first and only train of its kind in the world, with a direct airline connection, pulls out with its air-minded guests. From New York to Columbus, Ohio, dinner, bedtime, breakfast the next morning, and then, a few minutes later, the Airway Limited pulls into Port Columbus, where our first day of flying will begin. At each of these air terminals, we find unexpected comforts and conveniences beautifully appointed restrooms, and courteous attendants who look after our traveling needs. Here at Port Columbus, our baggage is weighed. 30 pounds is the allowance. It is 8.15 in the morning now, time to take off. The big tri-motor all-metal plane is ready and waiting, equipped like a Pullman car. Its roomy cabin is well lighted and heated in wintertime. Seated in our comfortable chairs, we are all set now to see America best. rushes by, then all is flowing smoothness. The city of Columbus, Ohio quickly passes under us with a majestic skyscraper serving notice on air travelers that other cities beside New York have their symbols of America reaching upward. For only a moment or two. On our first hop to Indianapolis, 180 miles to the west, less than two hours by air, the courier is looking after our comfort. Souvenir maps are spread before you. You begin to look for familiar landmarks. Arriving at the airport at Indianapolis, and at this same time, at every airport along the route, the teletype system reports the news on our progress. Here at the general office, they read the flash of our arrival. So through the day, mile after mile, our plane is watched, reported on, prepared for at our next stop, which now will be St. Louis, 232 miles away. Two hours later, nearing St. Louis, we see the Missouri and Mississippi rivers joining into one. Then a long, smooth glide to a landing to another 15-minute pause in our journey westward. We are taking this trip in the wintertime. As a matter of fact, it is eight below zero as most of these scenes are made. But modern air travel is a year-round accomplished fact, and airliners nowadays are as snug and comfortable as your own private yacht. Here at St. Louis, you step out again for a stroll around. While the motors are being inspected and additional fuel is put aboard, these motors, incidentally, are looked after as carefully as a fine watch. And after being in use for a specified number of hours, 
Each motor is completely overhauled by a corps of experts working under the supervision of Colonel Lindbergh. As technical advisor to the airline, Colonel Lindbergh has instilled his own insistence upon perfect motor performance, overhauling and frequent replacements, which from his experience is the way to safety in flying. Twenty-nine minutes. In the meantime, stroll to the forward cockpit of your plane and take a look at the pilot's weather report. An army of trained observers compile these records, making observations daily and hourly over the entire line. Here an observer is following the course of a gas-filled balloon to determine wind direction and velocity at varying altitude. These and other hourly observations are condensed into a at its convenient airport. Then, on to Wichita, Kansas. 173 miles as the crow flies. We are flying exactly on schedule. We'll arrive at Wichita on time. What is the surface wind at Wichita? The surface wind at Wichita is east-southeast, eight miles per hour. Oh, say, Bill, Lindbergh's on the line. He ought to be passing your ship about now. Lindbergh's making an inspection trip of the line today. All right, we'll watch for him. Good news about Lindbergh. We'll be looking for him. Okay, goodbye. Say, Joe, they're making pictures up here today. We're in the movies now, boy. So long. This radio communication is one of the greatest factors of safety in modern air travel. And now, Colonel Lindbergh, on a coast-to-coast -coast inspection of the line, passes our ship in midair. He throttles down to look things over. That's the Colonel's office he's riding in. You're seeing Colonel Lindbergh on the job at work. Now we are coming to Wichita, where there are so many airplane factories. The words fly away Wichita will soon be almost as well known as FOB Detroit. And then on the last lap of our first day's flying, we see what smart western farmers plant for farm relief. A swarm of oil derricks cover the landscape. We are in Oklahoma now. We have traveled almost a thousand miles by air. And as the sun sinks down into the west, an aero car whisks us to town where an appetizing dinner awaits. Now again, it is night time, and you are asleep aboard the Santa Fe Railway. Morning find us in Clovis, New Mexico, where another plane with new pilots and a new kind of country. is a delegation of 100% Americans, keenly interested in air travel and air travel. They gather here to sell you some of their native handiwork.
attended to your shopping, and while the ship is being refueled and inspected, Chief Tippecanoe of the local tribe brings in future young brave for a look at White Man's latest surprise. Squaw and Papoose, too, are included in this personally conducted tour. And if you should ask the chief what the Indian name for airplane is, he will tell you Oche Kupiwao, which means wagon like a bird. Albuquerque on a 240-mile hop to Winslow, Arizona. We fly over the Mesa Gigante, then on through a bank of silvery clouds round the tops of the San Mateo Mountains. Now, certainly you are coming to country worth writing home about. Next, the painted desert swims into view, the colors of violet, amber, and rose. To the north, the petrified forests of Arizona. South the Apache Indians' favorite hunting grounds. Here also was the hunting ground of Billy the Kid, that famous bandit of the wild and woolly west. Your next stop will be Kingman, Arizona, 186 miles on the map, just an hour and a half to you. On one of the many souvenir postcards of your trip is a picture of the famous meteor crater. We are coming to it now, a mighty hole three miles in circumference, which scientists tell us was made by a falling star. At the bottom we can see the huts of the geologists who are digging down to the treasures which, they say, this meteor contains. Then with a suddenness that thrills, great chasms and canyons splash into view, a ruggedness and a beauty which only air travelers are privileged to see. This is the famous Lee's Canyon you've heard about. A pair of binoculars brings into view its giant fingers of very colored stone, like a mighty pipe organ in a cathedral of the gods. We're leaving Kingman, Arizona now, for the last hop of our trip from coast to coast, 300 miles to the city of Los Angeles. We will have crossed the country in less than 48 hours. Passing over the Colorado River, which forms the dividing line of three states. In the bend of this river, we can see a part of Arizona, Nevada, and California. Then a vast stretch of desert lies before us. The Devil's Collar Button in the Mojave Desert of California. Death Valley lies 60 miles to the north. These are the lands over which the pioneers struggled in their covered wagons. Where once it took weeks and months to cross this vast expanse, we are now winging our way across in little more than an hour's comfortable flight.